Today we get to talk with Colette Mesher from the Ontario Beekeepers Association. She was a board member and is now the lead technician for the Ontario Beekeepers Association. She also runs her own apiary called Miel Rebel Honey with hives in several Ontario locations. Colette, welcome to Two Old Guys Talking. Yeah, that works. Okay, great. We got it. We got that part. <laughs> Colette, when I started looking at, at the beekeeping industry, I was surprised at just how big it is. Yeah, and it's it compared to some other um, commodities, you know, like beef or dairy, uh, we're relatively small. Uh, but because of the impact of pollination, we actually there there's a lot of money that comes in that's uh, indirectly or directly related to beekeeping. How many? Um, like in, in like, there's not a lot of people keep dairy cows on the side. Uh, you're either the dairy <laughs> for, so what's well, sort of the division between people who like do this for a living and those that are uh, uh, doing their part because they're passionate about bees? Uh, yeah, especially because of the pandemic. Um, so we refer to anyone with less than 50 colonies as a hobbyist. Um, in, in general, um, you're going, they're going to be sideliners at, at 50, but the, a lot of um, hobbyist beekeepers will be keeping one, two, three, four, five colonies. And, and then above 50, it's really, we, there's an imaginary line at 200. You're probably going to be making this your full-time gig, your full-time job at, at 200 colonies. Um, and above, you're going to be doing this full-time. Um, so it's generally commercial beekeepers and hobbyist beekeepers, basically. What, what would the ratio be? Uh, as far as uh, the ones under 50 who are um, yeah, so maybe, it's, maybe it's not as worried about as an income stream, but uh, yeah. 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 I would say the vast majority of people fall under the hobbyist category. There's probably only about 200 commercial beekeepers in Ontario out of right. the say 1800 that are registered with the OBA. Even right. that's that, even that amount surprises me. I, I wouldn't have thought that it would have been so big, but. Was it changed in recent years? Like you mentioned pandemic, yeah. Yeah. is that uh, uh, got people buzzing around? <laughs> yes, it, it really, really has. Um, that uh, uh, pe people being at home and only been able to do things really outdoors um, yeah. has led to a huge surge. Um, so I've worked for uh, beekeeping equipment companies and, and I still work with them now because they're, they're a good partner for us um, to kind of get information out to the, the general beekeeping public. And the incredible interest has grown and grown. We thought it was going to kind of taper off. You know, 2020 was going to be a big year for getting into, you know, gardening and, and baking bread and honeybee. Um, but the it's definitely has continued the interest is still very much there and we get new beekeepers signing up to the oba and uh coming to our courses and asking us questions every year it just keeps growing and does the oba have um like a passion uh, uh with regards to uh like really promoting that almost hobbyist or is it the commercial that they see uh the best investment of your resources um, I think we try and balance it. We try and focus programs that are geared towards uh, commercial beekeepers. So, for example, we had two uh, a series of talks uh, last, actually this month, still March, um, and where one of them was entirely geared, you know, how do you hire people? How do you register your truck with the Ontario government? That kind of really focused right. on, on sure. commercial side. And then we also had um, basically how to keep your hives healthy geared a little bit more towards the hobbyist beekeepers who don't have as in-depth knowledge who don't live this every day so really come at this as like i want to um i want to care for some bees and i have no idea how to do it um so i think we, we try and do both we end up spending a lot of our education and outreach time focusing more on hobbyist beekeepers um because although now there is niagara college does have a commercial beekeeping program yes, yeah. um it, it's been operating i don't know five years or something like that but it's still relatively new um yeah. so there's now like an actual stream you know a lot of um people in agriculture farmers they will come from a history of farming right um that, that you know their grandfather was a dairy farmer so they're a dairy farmer kind of thing and you definitely get that there is a definite generational component to a lot of the, the commercial um side of the of beekeeping 
However, you do get a lot of hobbyists, like literally I live in Toronto and I want to keep bees on the roof of my building people. Yeah. Um, there is, there's a big surge in that and a big interest. And of course the media helps feed that too, right? Save the bees. It's a little bit of a, an overstatement in, the, in a simplification of a very large problem that native bees, bumblebees, solitary bees, even butterflies and flies who are pollinators, they really deserve energy and time and flowers and preservation. But honey, European honeybees, which is what we work with as beekeepers, they are a whole separate entity. Um, they, they are not native to Canada. They have been here for a couple hundred years. Um, they did come over basically when, when Europeans did come over to North America. Um, but in true uh, biology sense, in, in evolutionary terms, honeybees are not native to Ontario or not native anywhere in North America. So they are, it's an agriculture and a farm. So if I can really interrupt good. there, yeah. Colette, because I'm old and I will forget to ask this question. So before honeybees came here, what was handling, like we hear about how important they are to pollin uh, pollination. So mm -hmm. what was going on before that? Uh, so before that, so we're talking about, oh, I wish I had the date in my head. It's like 1662. So you didn't have widespread uh, um, farming. You didn't have large, especially now where uh, machines have meant that monocropping is how you, how you optimize your land and how you make the most money is because you plant entirely tomatoes, you plant entirely canola, yes. whatever it is. Um, prior to that, you know, prior to the big mechanization industrial revolution, you had small plots of land and a lot more wilding. So a lot more just wild plants and, and natural vegetation available. So you didn't have this pressure where you really absolutely needed to have honeybees. But because we very much shifted to like a whole field of almond trees, a whole field of blueberries, um, you have to have the help of the honeybee who are very efficient pollinators, even on fruits and vegetables that they're not the optimal pollinator for they are still very good because there's so many of them and you can literally plonk down a million honeybees in one area and they will do a great job at pollinating these crops even if they're not the most efficient because you can just import them right if you could import a, a million um bumblebees right it wouldn't be an issue but that's just that's not a possibility so wow. it's it's really distinguishing between um native pollinators who who are, who are very separate from honeybees, which are an agricultural husbandry kind of idea. So it's really trying to separate those two. The media tends to just throw them all together. Bees are wonderful, may, and they are. Bees really are just, wonderful. It may just be me that, that was ignorant of that, but that's one of the biggest surprises that I had, and you just touched on that, like for instance in California, those huge almond farms, is that there is an industry that where they import vast colonies of bees like these bees are like migrant workers they're, they're being yes. otherwise there would be no almond crop and i had no idea that uh, um uh, that those things they got so large that now they have to have people who do nothing but have transport trucks of bees that travel around the the uh, the country yes correct so in, in Canada, we don't have the same pressure. We obviously benefit from the almonds and, and those, those migratory beekeepers. Um, but in Canada, the main crop, so out west is canola. Um, and then all the way out west, out BCs, you have uh, blueberries. And then out east, so Quebec, you have cranberries. And then further into the Maritimes, you have the different type of blueberries. So that's the kind of overview of course you can have apples and pears and cherries and all sorts in, in across canada but the major crops are those where beekeepers in canada are going to be migrating their bees they don't they put them on tractor trailers but they don't keep them there they tend to just have one contract they'll go and do the blueberry pollination and then come back to ontario and stay in ontario um, so it's a little bit of a different way of doing it, but I think people just don't realize like the the actual way that you get the blueberries on the shelf in the store, right? And I think that's just it's it's part of our our society and our disconnect. You know, if you live in Toronto or Vancouver, you you can't have a giant garden. 
right? You, you, yeah. you are dependent on the grocery store. Um, so we do get disconnected from our food sources, um, which is great that honeybees and bees in general have come back into the, the consciousness and, and are a hot topic to talk about in the media. Um, but it really, it, it just, it, it can open your eyes to the realization of, yeah, I have no idea. You know, like a, a child could grow up in a city and have no idea where milk comes from. Yeah. I, I, I think what you're saying is that the business of pollination is much bigger than the business of honey. Yes. So um, the honey, honey is a volatile um, product in terms of the, the price of it. So right now the price is up. So uh, some beekeepers will be more investing in getting a honey crop. But of course, because you're wildly dependent on the weather. Honeybees need to fly in order to collect nectar and you need to have lots of flowers. So that's why the, a huge amount of honey comes out of the canola fields in uh, out west, right? In Alberta and Saskatchewan. Because literally you can predict the flowers open, boom, the bees are working it and they're putting six, 10 boxes on top of these hives with these giant towers of honey collecting machines. They're really good at it. Whereas in Ontario and Quebec and even into the Maritimes, we have wildflower honey. We don't have anywhere near the same size of, of canola fields. So they are dependent on bright sunshine, allowing the flowers to grow and for the bees to be able to go and collect that nectar. Because if it rains, bees can't collect nectar. If it's super dry, flowers don't produce nectar. So you, beekeepers who want a solid guaranteed amount of money, right, you know that the blueberries are going to need X amount of colonies. So you can devote a ton of time in April and May, and then move your bees in into pollination in June, and you have the money you have for the whole year right there. And then you can get a bit of honey if you want, um, depending on what goes on in the season. So you really do have different types of beekeepers who focus on different things. You're always going to get some sort of honey, but is it going to be enough to employ people on and pay your mortgage and, and your business costs? Right. right. So that's a big challenge for beekeepers to pick those things and hope that they pick the right commodity in the right year. Is there, this is kind of be like, the word, I find this like a really fascinating topic and it's amazing on YouTube. Like when you look at, uh, look up bees, these things, these videos have millions of hits. I always wondered, like, is there really that big a difference in honey A, like blueberry honey versus the canola honey versus the or is that marketing um so marketing definitely plays into it in terms of the value right honey like if, if it was up to me honey would be the value of gold would be whatever per pound because what goes into producing honey is unbelievable but i i like to blame billy b it's not just billy b's fault but billy b especially in canada gave you an idea they they blended the product and they heated the product to make it liquid so that's what people thought honey was was essentially liquid sugar and it had a very um uh, uh, uh taste that remained the same right and just like mcdonald's you want to go to mcdonald's in british columbia or you want to go to mcdonald's in texas it's going to be the same food it's going to taste the same right because that's that's what they're they're they depend on that's where their market right. share is but now that so many people have gotten into beekeeping, you can now get honey from your neighbor and be tasting the flowers that are right there. And there is a huge, huge, unbelievable variety of honey. And because I myself am a small beekeeper, a small scale beekeeper, I extract my honey by hand. So I, I literally uncap each frame yeah. individually. And I found two frames, just two frames. At a, you get nine in a box. And I probably had 30 from this hive. I found two frames that were an entirely different nectar source, entirely different color, entirely different flavor. Oh, cool. So it, it, it's easy for big, big beekeepers to blend it and it tastes all the same and everyone likes it. But actually, when you get into the like the micro brewery kind of idea for yeah. honey, you realize, oh, there's a huge amount of flavor difference and texture difference and just how how did this happen? And it's because flowers are all different. You know, if you just eat canola honey, you'll get used to that flavor and that's what you will expect. But buckwheat honey, blueberry honey, wildflower honey tastes unbelievably drastically different. And the color that comes in also is tied to the value of your honey. Um, so it's, it, 
you need to create a market for yourself. Like I create a market. I've got, you know, people who love my honey and who come to me for my honey. And then sometimes I'll be a bit confused to be like, it tastes different yeah, because it's a different year. It's 2022 now and you were eating 2021 honey. So it, it sometimes surprises people, but there really is. It's like being a sommelier, same thing. Once your what palate gets say. developed. Do your chapters have uh, like taste testing events? That would be neat. We, we, we do. It, it can be challenging because uh, within Ontario, there are 33 local beekeepers associations. Um, so there's lots of overlap. And, and especially with wildflowers, it gets to be a bit of a blend. Um, but if you find that you happen to have one yard that is really has lots of one particular flower, which produces a different taste, um, you definitely, beekeepers are very proud of their honey and love to come in and, and, and swap honey. So most of the time when you have a meeting, um, like the, the Eastern Apiculture Society has a meeting in September and there'll be a big honey swap there where you go, you bring three jars of your honey and you take away three jars. Um, and, and there are courses, uh, Apimondia is the World Beekeeping Federation. Um, and they have courses exactly that where you're taste testing and you learn to be a judge for honey. I mean, just like the general public. <laughs> I, you get like I belong to Rotary. Occasionally they have wine tasting events. They use as a okay. fundraiser. That'd be neat to have a bunch of Different beekeepers come in with different samples. Of course, we'd all leave diabetic after that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that, that's, I, I just, like, even the, like you say, the colors. I, I thought I saw something about somebody's honey was, like, multicolored, and they found out they were near an M&M factory or something. Yes. <laughs> yes, we actually, we, there was a beekeeper in Hamilton where they were next door to where they kept some of their hives. They're, they were root beer. They had a root beer. Um, oh, like I would have bought that. <laughs> and, and it had a root beer flavor to the honey. They, they had it tested. They said it is genuine honey because it's got pollen in it, but it has been flavored by this root beer. And so it was, they, they marketed it as root beer honey. Well, if you go to a taste testing event for honey, what do you, do you dip it in bread or a, a stick or your finger or what do you do? It would probably be a stick or a spoon for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and like the 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 Royal um, Agricultural Fair, they have a honey competition and they have the most incredible rules when it comes to what you're allowed to submit. Mm -hmm. um, it always makes me giggle because it's, it's such a precise, it has to be like your jar has to be so filled high and all of this stuff. Um, but basically, yeah, you want it to be a spoon or, or, or a stir stick, something like that is what you would taste it with for sure. A bit of a tangent, but you know it's been in the news a lot about uh, bees' health, and uh, one of the things that I was always again I don't really know exactly what they do, but I understand that bees uh, will have their diet supplemented by a beekeeper with with glucose, and like how does a beekeeper know what ratio they can remove from a hive and not like because they make it for themselves for their own health. And one would think they would manufacture sort of a built-in, this is enough to last here, and then we scoop it, and then we add something that really is not what they were intended to eat. And and I, I'm not saying it wasn't pesticides or stuff, but can that not compromise the, the genetics over time if, if the, the, the bees are not eating what they're supposed to be eating, kind of like us? Um, so it's, it's a bit of a, um, there's a couple things in there. So one, we have um, genetically selected our honeybees to be massive honey producers. Uh, honeybees naturally oh. in Europe, you know, in France or Poland like or Jackson. England, oh, okay. they, yeah. they will live in small um, basketball sized cavities. And that's because they can defend that, they can keep it warm and they can um, be successful and, and live out their lives in the smaller cavity. And then they don't need this like, excessive amount of honey right? right um so whereas we've as beekeepers we've just oh hey if you actually select these types of bees you'll just get so much honey you can collect it yourself now the challenge with uh leaving bees uh, a natural honey source is that one you have to leave 
the whole range, especially in a place like Ontario, where you have, you know, in the early um, spring, it's going to be dandelion, and then it's going to be wildflowers, and it's going to be goldenrod. But goldenrod crystallizes much faster. And so the crystallization process um, differs, right? You can have really small crystals, really big crystals. Um, so the bigger the crystals, the harder it is for the bees to consume. So the bees can actually starve sitting on a frame of goldenrod honey because it's crystallized because they require water to break those crystals down and consume it. Uh, so you have to be really careful as a beekeeper to make sure that what there is in their colony for the winter to get them that those food reserves to get them through the winter is actually not going to crystallize, it's going to be available to them, yeah, right. which is yeah. why we actually supplement with, uh, with um, it's just white processed sugar. And the reason that the white processing is important is because it removes impurities. And you know, you think, oh, like brown sugar and maple syrup, this would be healthier. But actually, those additives upset the bee's stomach and gives them dysentery, which can kill them because they they don't have a lot of it. They don't have food reserves, right? So it's very easy to to hurt a bee um, over winter like that because they're dealing with such extreme weather. So it's actually quite dangerous to just leave natural honey especially when you have the honeybees in an environment they don't naturally live, right? So you're putting them in Ontario, you're giving them six months of winter. So you actually are, can set them up better for winter by leaving them some natural honey sources, but massively supplementing with just white sugar. It's not high fructose corn syrup by and large in Canada. It's generally going to be just processed white sugar. Um, and they take it down and they actually add enzymes. So um, nectar on flowers is not honey. It literally is like runny like water. Um, and if you were to drink it, it doesn't have the natural enzymes that the bees themselves add to break down the sugars and uh, reduce the moisture and add those amino acids, which we then eat and get the benefit from. Um, so the honeybees, when they take down the syrup, they're still processing it. They're still handling it themselves and processing it and adding enzymes, breaking it down, um, and fanning it down so you get this really thick syrup that they store. Um, so honeybees are still getting the benefit. It's not like you're giving them candy when you want them to have fruits and vegetables. Yeah. It's not a simple dichotomy like that because so, the handling of the bees and the breaking down of the sugars is an important part of the creation of those food stores. So as a scientist, you have no pro problem that there's any, that would not contribute to, um, uh, 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 being a deterrent to health. Uh, uh, yeah, as, lo as long as it's good quality. Yeah, as long as it, just like anything, if you give them bad quality syrup, of course it's going to upset their stomachs. Of course it's going to hurt them over winter. Yeah. So if you give them good quality syrup, there's absolutely no problem. The idea that sugar is, is bad and honey is good doesn't apply in the same way for bees when you're putting them in this very uh, um, husbandry, a modified way of living through the winter. It's important to keep that in mind that you're helping them by giving them sugar water. You're not deter, you're not um, impacting their health, especially on a bad honey year. So you can leave all of the honey that the bees collect, literally every single drop, you take nothing and the bees can still starve because they can't access it and it might still not be enough. Oh. So that's why even if you leave all of the honey they collect, you decide, no, I don't want anything from the bees. We still wow. tell people to supplement because it takes, you have to think that right now, if I go into a honey beehive, it's, you know, minus whatever, right now, minus one at, at home right now. If I put my hand on, if I open up a honey beehive and I put my hand on it, it's going to be 25 degrees Celsius in there because they're insects and they will die if it gets too cold. So they have two sets of wings, all the worker bees, all the females have two sets of wings that they unhook so that because they need them hooked to fly. But of course, you don't want to fly. You just want to create energy because it creates heat. So that's all they're doing. They're consuming this food in order to create the heat, to generate the heat that this cluster, just imagine penguins in the Antarctic, right? You know how they rotate in and out and in and out and, in and out and they create, they hold that heat in the center. That's exactly what they do because in the center is their queen. And in order for the queen to be um, able to lay eggs, and she's just starting to do that now as the days lengthen and the, the, the temperatures warm up, the queen is going to start to lay again. All of that takes a tremendous amount of energy and heat that they have to keep generating, right? Because our nights are still cold and they're still wrapped up for winter. 
So there's a tremendous amount of energy that's required that because we falsely put them in this cold environment, like there are, there are honeybee colonies in Nunavut, right? Yeah. So you, we can keep them in these environments, but you have to help them succeed to get all the way through the springtime. And as to how much honey do you pull out of a hive? Uh, like, is there a too much? You can't, you have to leave some sugar or not, or uh, like. It, it's entirely up to you as a beekeeper, um, whether or not, you know, commercial beekeepers are probably pulling as much as possible. Um, whereas a lot of the hobbyists, one, we, we have no desire. I have so many pails of honey in my house. It is unbelievable uh. because I, you have two good honey years in a row and I have more honey than I could sell. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, so you, or you have a really bad year and you have to leave everything for the bees and, and beekeepers do. And some beekeepers will have to supplement in the middle of a season because it dries up, right? You know, we, we, we have a changing climate that we're, we're, we're struggling to all survive in. And if you have a bad year where it's very dry, you'll be feeding the bees in the middle of the season because the flowers are not producing any nectar because they will starve because you know the queen is like i want to produce more genetics more genetics and she has these massive hives with sixty thousand honeybees in a box but if the flowers stop producing nectar there's nothing to eat so you do actually need to just be very careful and be very aware and tied in with the environment and what your goals are as a beekeeper is that you know just because i we've had this where inexperienced beekeepers say well i left all the honey isn't that enough well, was it a good honey year or was it a bad right. honey year? Yeah, I, I guess I for somehow thought, set it up and come back in the fall. But in the, you have in the to 19, be a lot more yeah. aware of what's going on in that environment. That's <laughs> oh, definitely. Good. Especially because it's since the 1980s. Um, so the Varroa mite, um, Varroa yeah. destructor, uh, turned up in North America in the 1980s. And it is a hugely destructive mite. And prior to that, you could, you could literally buy a package of bees from the US, throw them on some equipment, um, care for them a little bit, throw some honey supers on, walk away, come back in August to a huge honey crop. Right. Yes, definitely. You used to be able to do that. But now, because our environment is more challenging, it's not just about it getting warmer. It's about extremes in temperature. <laughs> And it's all of these different challenges that you have all the time, and whether it's a dry year, a wet year, it's an early spring, it's a late spring. And then you add pests and diseases on top of that. And the Varroa mite being number one it is the um, largest explanation for colony loss in Ontario is Varroa destructor. Um, so you spend as a beekeeper a tremendous amount of time checking for pests and diseases and treating for varroa mites to keep their population low because they're everywhere. They're everywhere around the world except for New Newfoundland and parts of Australia. Everywhere else has them and possibly New Zealand. Um, but they are, they're, for a parasite, if you can take away the badness, they're a fantastic parasite. They're so great at what they do and they have a very small genetic pool and yet they seem to survive everything. Um, but they're extremely de destructive to honeybees. And as a beekeeper, you're constantly fighting them. You're constantly working against that. And it is, it's a huge challenge. And that's where the learning comes in and what people think exactly like you say, oh, I'll just you know, get a box of honeybees. And it's, it's easy, you just put it in the garden and you just throw some boxes on and at the end of the season, you collect it and it's all, it's easy, it's good. I'm a farmer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I wish it was that simple, but part of it, the reason that I love honeybees so much is that they are extremely challenging to keep healthy and to be successful year after year after year so that it doesn't get boring. That's it's certainly the case. It is not boring. It's very challenging and we're constantly doing new research and discovering, oh, oh, we were totally wrong about that. We need to yeah. change how we do things. And then that's where I come in as a as an extension specialist, as an educator, to try and teach beekeepers like, oh, we discovered something new. We want you to change how you feed them or how you keep them and, and or do something extra to help your bees be healthier going into winter. Because that is basically your point, is that as soon as spring hits, you're like, okay, what is my goal for the year and how do I keep them healthy all the way to the end of the season and make them super strong and healthy going into winter so that they can survive that really, that long, cold time. So Paul or I call you or your organization and say, we want to be beekeepers. Um, how do you qualify us and encourage us or 
discourage us if like what would what would you, how would so because I know people are going to listen to this and they're going to uh, they think geez maybe I could do this this might be fun how do you filter the wheat from the chaff? <laughs> um, well, the number one question I always get asked, regardless of what position I hold, is do you get stung all <laughs> the time? I have been stung hundreds, if not thousands of times. And I keep, I do not tolerate angry bees. I keep very gentle bees. Um, I work with very gentle bees. I don't, I don't tolerate anything angry because I, I work with children, so I don't want that. Um, but you will be stung. So if you have a big fear of being stung, maybe this isn't for you. I have taught as young as nine years old. I taught a little girl with her dad, nine years old. They, were, they had bought a farm. Her brother was doing ducks. She was doing honeybees. But not every nine-year-old is the same, just as not every 20-year-old is the same, yeah. right? Yeah. So you have, and some, and, some, and I've, I've shown kids a hive, and they were super scared. And I said, I get it. Because if someone showed me a box of spiders, I would just touch it. It's fine. They're very soft and fuzzy. I'd be like, you're crazy. I'm not touching spiders. So I understand. Is it, and it's the same thing for people. You, so people have a genuine fear. It's mostly of wasps. I will say this, is that yellow jackets give all flying insects a bad name because they have a hypodermic needle for a stinger, right? They don't have barbs. Whereas bumblebees and honeybees, they so have barbs. More than once. Exactly. So honeybees, when they sting you, they die. So you as a beekeeper, you've done something wrong because she was willing to sacrifice her life to defend her hot. Mm -hmm. So that's what I take it as. It's, it's the bees trying to communicate with you is that it's, it's the nicest thing about working a honeybee colony is that they are talking to you and you are learning their language. And as soon as you open that hive, they have started talking and they might need to scream at you to get your attention if you're not paying enough attention. And all beekeepers have done this, especially when you're doing demonstrations, you're thinking about people and cameras and all these distractions. And you forget that the honeybees are constantly talking. And if you start to ignore them and they get upset, then that's when they'll start to stay. Are they right? smart enough to know that only one or two of them need to sting you? Uh, it, it's a, there is a genetic component to defensiveness. Um, you can actually select for low defensiveness. Um, and that's where the Africanized honeybee, the quote unquote killer honeybee comes from. Yeah. is that you they are at a very high level of defense so they are very willing to sting and they're willing to chase you down to sting you whereas the vast majority especially in ontario because we're so densely packed together um you have uh honeybees that that you they're very low defense you could knock their hive over and they'd be like what's going on ah. and they won't come out and sting you that, those are the kind of honeybees you want in general it's a pheromone thing as well so when honeybees sting you whether they sting your leather glove or they sting your arm your naked arm they they do leave a pheromone and then if you have a highly defensive hive or a hive that's really riled up it's really hot the, the box is all taken apart they've been open for a long time you get stung once, you're going to get stung multiple times. Right. So th there's a bunch of different components. It's not just a simple, yes, they sting or no, they don't sting. It really has to do with circumstances, their genetics and the, the pheromone and how they react to that pheromone. Paul and I know now that we could get stung and we say we're still interested. Now, now, now what would you be <laughs> asking a person if you didn't know anything about them? Um, is that go and take a course from... Uh, and a, somewhere reputable. Like you've mentioned, the internet is a wild and wonderful place, but it is a rabbit hole you can fall down into, especially with beekeeping, and never come out of. So find information that is based in your region. So whether you're out in British Columbia, you're going to have different rules to, uh, to, to people here in Ontario or in Texas. Oh, so it's yes. really important to be finding localized information um, and that there are bylaws as well as provincial legislation within your own province which tells you can you keep bees in your backyard can you can you uh whatever it is how many colonies you're allowed to have anything like that whether you need to register whether you need to take a course or a specific type of course these things are all written down so respecting those rules and regulations 
really important. And so that's why I would say go to a, you know, the, a university, uh, your provincial government, depending on where you are, will have different courses available. So for us here in Ontario, we have the University of Guelph, the Ontario Beekeepers Association, Niagara College, Algonquin College, a number of different places who host um, courses every spring and also do online courses. So we were super fortunate um, at the Ontario Beekeepers Association. We already had uh, our website with some of our courses online. So once the pandemic hit and people wanted to get outdoors and pick up new hobbies because they weren't allowed to socialize, they were able to go to our website, take a, a course based in Ontario with Ontario information, and they could call us and we could give them feedback. Um, and now that hopefully we're turning a corner and been able to get back to in-person courses, we can then get out again and, and do the in-person aspect. Because beekeeping online is wonderful. It's a great way to learn. But physically being in a honeybee hive is a very different experience. So again, you know, take an online course. Are you still interested? Super. It, it can be a one-hour course or a 10-hour course, whatever it is. Take that and then go and get some hands-on experience. So this is where the local beekeeping associations really comes into its own. Beekeepers, oh, we love to talk about bees. We love to talk about how we do things. We love sharing. So if you don't want to go ahead and buy a honeybee colony or take an in-person course from, from, from us, then go join your local beekeeping association and go and find a mentor. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I trained 66 mentors this winter um, in order to help with that dissemination of really solid local information and those people literally their job is is to be a source of good information for all those new beekeepers who are going to start joining those clubs um, and then you can go out and you can touch a frame of honeybees you can get stung you can lift those boxes and and be working out in the heat and see whether or not you're comfortable uh wearing gloves or no gloves a whole bee suit or just a veil um, that that in-person hands-on experience will really be the determinant of do you want to do this or not do you want to have this in your backyard or on your friend's giant 10 acre property whatever it ends up being so the upfront costs could actually vary quite a bit for a beginner beekeeper Absolutely. If you're a carpenter or you have a family member that's a carpenter, um, you can drastically reduce your cost. So, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars to get everything that you need really to get started as a as a beekeeper. Um, so, yes, cost can vary a lot. Yeah. But first, you're going to actually have to check out the regulations for the region that you live in. Yes. Right. Is a lot of people, they they get into confrontations and they have issues because they just didn't realize there were rules. They just thought, well, it's like a dog. I can just like go out and buy a dog. Yeah. Except, you know, when you buy a dog, then you realize, oh yeah, that's right. I need to have that tag from the city. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. I probably should find a good vet. And they do need to be vaccinated. Oh, maybe some, some behavioral classes and, and some exercise classes. And suddenly, you know, depending on how much you want to invest, right, can suddenly balloon up and be this big thing or this little thing. And it depends on your skill set. Maybe you are, maybe you're a carpenter and, and this is nothing and super easy and you can get 50 hives and off you go. John, have you ever encountered any of your clients that have apiaries? Well, no, but I was, this is on my list to dig down oh. to, uh, because like when you talk about a dog, uh, yes, you can have a dog in the city, but your neighbors are entitled to the quiet enjoyment of their homes. And that's sort of a critical aspect of, of, of bees because they're not going to stay in the yard and maybe my neighbor does have a big allergy or whatever but I have uh, perhaps mistakenly got the impression that municipalities have opened up to the concept of intercity hives in certain circumstances so how have they navigated those waters uh, Colette? Um, so it, it varies dependent on, on where you live. And, and the, this concept of a, a bee city right, has come up a, a number of times and, and cities labeled, we're a bee-friendly city. Um, and some of it is just a PR stunt and some of it does turn into these wonderful pollinator gardens, which are very fruitful. But it really just depends on where you live. And um, OMAFRA, which is the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, they uh, govern honeybees and the Bees Act in Ontario. And uh, they employ bee inspectors. 
So people, everyone in Ontario must register your hive. And by and large, all jurisdictions in, in Canada have this. You must register your hive. It's free or, or very small amount of money. And you register them with the province and you get access to these bee inspectors. So if I'm, oh no, my beehive is sick and I don't know why, I can get a bee inspector to come out and help me. But equally, if you have a, a colony and you're, uh, it, it's going and, and they're all dying in your neighbor's swimming pool and your neighbor's super angry about it, they can also call the bee inspector and yeah. basically get, get the bee inspectors to come out and talk to you. Yeah. Um, and then the bee inspector's job is if you violate the Bees Act and the neighbor wants you to remove the beehive, they can issue an order that requires you to move it. Um, so as a beekeeper, an urban beekeeper, I do both rural and urban beekeeping myself. Um, I have found that communication and honey, gifts of honey, <laughs> go a very long way to keeping very happy neighbors, so, right? Like I don't advertise that I have honey, the odd time I have honeybee colonies right in my backyard, but I have very understanding neighbors. They all have kids, they have dogs. Um, and they've been very lovely. And I do, I reward them with gifts of honey to just say thank you for putting up with the fact that you're like, there's a weird sound going on back there. And you're like, yeah, it's just the honeybee colony. It's fine. Yeah. Um, but when you get an unhappy neighbor, it can be a miserable experience. Sure. Um, so, and no one wants the, the bee inspector to come out and tell you to move them. Some people are scared to register their hives because they're like, they're going to tell us to move our hives. Um, by and large, they really only intervene when it becomes a public health problem or a, a neighbor is pushing this and really angry. So if you can keep your neighbors happy um, and content, and there's lots of things that you can do to control where your honeybees go. So honeybees fly out of their colony within six feet. They'll be above the average person's height. So it's called a, a flight path. So they, they locate their hive and they fly in and they land. So it's if you stand directly in front of a hive or within a few feet of a hive, you're going to get pelted, right? You're going to hit all over your body again and again, because when the honeybees left, they, they, you were not there. So when they come back, they literally fly into you because they didn't, you're an obstruction that wasn't there before. Oh. So if you were to put um, trees around or, or bushes or within a certain amount of your hive, your honeybees will actually fly up and over and they'll be above the height of the average person. So that you wouldn't even notice that they're there because they're busy doing what they do. Um, but, you know, if you have a dearth, if you have a time where the flowers aren't producing, bees are going to go and find whatever they're going to go and find to eat. So as a beekeeper, you need to be very aware of that. So if you're going to do urban beekeeping, you've got to be on top of those colonies. There's nothing more terrifying to the general public than a swarm. Swarm is in general extremely calm, very docile, but it's terrifying to people who don't know what it is. Right. So in just like that neighbor, the example of the neighbor with the, the um, swimming pool, if you were to give them a good water source nearby, then they'll be more, much more interested in that easy source than that mm -hmm. person's swimming pool. So mm -hmm. you do have a certain amount of control. They're obviously wild animals and you, you don't only have so much control over them, but there is lots of things that you can do to reduce them being a nuisance. It's not just I'm keeping honeybees and everyone has to accept that. It is just being aware of potential problems and heading them off at the pass before they become a big issue and a big confrontation. Does the Bee Association or Bee, bee Association in general um, help and or encourage people to kind of scratch their bee itch without it having to be honeybees? Like uh, there are many types of bees that have uh, needs and there are things that we can do to like uh, even planting certain flowers, but um, but, but what other sort of uh, hives or, or accommodations can you do to encourage uh, the bee population that does things that maybe the honeybees don't do that's not as intrusive on a neighborhood? Yeah, so things like um, the mason bee houses, any of those bee houses, um, there's lots of different companies that do a bunch of different things. And it just there's a few caveats to keep in mind is that solitary bees, which is the vast majority of, of bees in Ontario, are going to be solitary. They need cavities to live in. And this is why they encourage you not to um, get into your garden too early in the year. Until it's kind of 10 degrees Celsius or higher consistently, um, the insects that are living in all of these branches and all this dead debris, uh, they, they need that shelter. So leaving your gardens for a little bit longer, uh, no mow may, um, as well as these, um, <clears throat> these bee houses, and just making sure that the 
the actual sticks that you put out for the bees, they're cleaned out every year. Because just like anything, there are viruses and pests and bacteria and fungi that can grow in them. So make sure they're clean, that they have a little awning so that if it is raining, you know, the, the mason bee has gone in, laid egg and put a little food packet, that the rain's not going to drive in, make it all moldy and kill its little offspring. Um, so just simple things like that, just really thinking about um, keeping it, uh, the, any mason bee houses clean and tidy and renewed every year can just be a really great way because if you're really observant, um, you can actually notice the different bees going in and using these. Um, so it can be a really nice way to interact with native bees. Um, and like you say, with pollinator gardens have actually a huge impact. Um, and if you put out a variety, especially perennials, they're so easy. They come up year after year. You don't have to do very much as a gardener. It's great. Um, and you can just sit and watch the various different insects that come and visit them um, and water sources. Even if you notice that it's a very dry year and you're having to water everything a lot, think about the insects. So putting out safe water sources. So there's a great examples of using um, bottle caps and putting them on sticks and leaving them out for honeybees or and, and, and bumblebees and all sorts of different bees. So, and you can make like a beautiful water feature, but the thing with insects is they're terrible swimmers by and large, right? Anything flighted is, is going to be a terrible swimmer. So you need something for them to land on. So, you know, lily pads and rocks and all sorts of things that you can create um, can actually be a great way to help and feed different pollinators without having to keep honeybees yourself. Did I see a bowl once with marbles in it filled with mm -hmm. water that allowed them? Yeah, you know, okay. Yes, exactly. Are, are there any um, zoonotic issues uh, uh, that beekeepers have to take in consideration that they, uh, like a disease they could pick up from working with bees? Like with cat, if you've got a pet cat, there's, there's certain things you have to be aware of, that kind of thing. Anything uh, with bees? Thankfully not. Um, you, it probably would be something like if you ate honey that would, was off. So you can have um, honey that's 18% moisture or less, totally fine to eat. That's why you can eat Egyptian honey from thousands of years ago, because it's right. naturally antibacterial and antifungal. And it, it with low moisture, totally fine, will stay good forever on a shelf. Um, but the only time I would imagine that the bees, other than being stung, really, is, um, is eating honey that has a high moisture, which would ferment, and that can make you sick. But nothing, you can't catch anything from the bees themselves. Bees. Once in a while. Yeah, go ahead. Once in a while in action movies, very once in a while, you'll see somebody get hurt or burned or something and they slaver honey onto the wound. And is that because what you just referred to a moment ago, you were saying was antibacterial? Um, so. Because honey has a very low moisture and is naturally anti antibacterial, um, there actually are companies that um, they do autoclave, like they do sanitize the honey, but yeah. they actually use it in bandages oh. because of that. Because of the low moisture, it draws moisture out of wounds right. and it prevents the growth of certain bacteria because it has a very high pH or sorry, or rather a very low pH and it's very acidic by and large. And that's where those properties come from. So Manuka honey, oh my goodness. Again, marketing. Huh, New Zealand, yes, the I... country, they did such a good job. You could not give Manuka honey away a number of years ago. <laughs> that stuff, it does not taste that great. It's quite, it's quite like like medicine tasting, right? But man, did they, it is a valuable, oh, did, there's so much um, value, like millions and millions of dollars that come out of this product now because they've gone with a very smart marketing strategy, oh, right? Yes. Where they, it is medicinal. It's good for you. And you want to pay $50 a pound for this. I was just reading about it the other day and I, I got to have this. I'm glad we're talking. And, <laughs> and actually... Um, the Fanshawe College did a bunch of research on exactly this, is that if it's not, because uh, tea tree oil, that's where the manuka comes from, is, is tea tree, and that's where the medicinal qualities come from. Um, but we don't have that, obviously, here in Canada. Um, what we do have, though, is, um, is these different pHs, and, and they can actually have different um, strengths and different qualities, and the peroxides. So that's what um, Fanshawe College was actually looking at was the, the, the level of peroxide. And that's why when you put it honey, raw honey, unprocessed honey on a wound, it can actually 
uh, have healing properties for exactly that reason, because it, it stops the growth of bacteria in your wound and draws that moisture out. So have it, you ever had Corbizola, honey? I don't think so. It's, uh, well, I, I, it's a, I, I just read about this a little, a little while ago too. It's from Greece, or I think Sardinia, and it, apparently it tastes horrible, uh, but it is well marketed. Uh, yeah, you, well, know, you, you have to have a look at it. It's the yeah. sort of thing you don't apparently taste more than once. <laughs> exactly. And you even have, so there are aphids. So in, in certain region in Eastern Europe, I forget, there is a pine tree that secretes some kind of sap that these aphids eat. And the secretions from the aphids are consumed by the honeybees and they make honey out of that. Wow. So given very certain narrow parameters, you get this very specific type of pine derived honey. I'm sure again, it doesn't taste that great, but it has very, um, uh, yes. Okay. I see, I see that link now. I That's actually, I think I read that article. I read that yeah. article that, um, the, the, it's not even nice tasting honey, but because it's rare and it's, it, you get the foodie market. Right as well, the foodie market has massively opened up the uh, availability of comb honey, of different flavors of honey, because you know a charcuterie board to me is not complete if you don't have comb honey on it. It's just not. Just forget about it. No. Um, so the and this idea of these experiences, right? You're going to taste this really disgusting cheese. You know, it's got maggots in it or whatever it is. But people love the idea of of experiencing something even if it's not a great tasting experience because it's a novelty so you definitely get that within the honey market and again yeah. it's, it's a market right it, it's how it's the, it's not a wide amount of customers but they are willing to pay a lot of money to have that experience paul remember yesterday we were talking paul about other things you can get from a hive and we were talking briefly about wax yes is that something that you harvest as well colette uh wax is way more valuable than honey way way more valuable oh, really? so honeybee wax is produced so imagine the size of a worker a female honeybee she's teeny tiny right she yeah. produces three or four or five tiny little wafers of wax that's where the honeybee wax comes from right they, they consume pollen and nectar to 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 get their food reserves up and produce tiny little sheets of wax and then they build it out in these little hexagons and they put their babies in it right and then when there's enough resources, they build more out and they put nectar in it and pollen in it, store it. So that's why it requires thousands of honeybees to produce even one tiny little pound. The, the cost of beeswax should be even greater because you only get so much of it as a beekeeper. The by and large, the best wax is, comes from the cappings of the sealed honey frame. So the honey frame, right, it, it, it looks very flat and smooth, covered in wax. We scrape off that wax and centrifuge out the honey. But we don't take the rest of the wax, by and large, from the frame because it's a valuable commodity that you put back in and the bees don't have to build again. Oh. So you're only keeping the cappings from those honey supers. And that is the most light colored, brightest, most beautiful candles and different things that come from wax. Are, are going to be produced from that. So you need to be, it took me, I don't know, three years of beekeeping before I could make a single candle. Oh. Because you, just, you don't get a lot of it. If you only have a couple yeah. hives, you don't get a lot of wax at all. Oh. Is it ever necessary for honey to be pasteurized? No, again, that was, that was just marketing. And the reason you heat honey up and pasteurize it is um, because you want it to be liquid. Honey is not naturally liquid when it is exposed to air. It is liquid because the bees put a capping on it in the hive. It will remain liquid by and large. It can still crystallize depending on the nectar source, but by and large, it will, it will remain liquid. Um, but once you uncap it, it's exposed to air, it starts the crystallization process. And by heating it up and thereby pasteurizing it, you're extending the shelf life of the liquid form. Because honey, let me tell you, honey is sticky. Okay, I, I fill a jar of honey and then I go and touch something and then the whole house is sticky and somehow I don't know everywhere there's honey. Um, and people don't like to be sticky. So they wanna be able to butter their 
their toast in the morning and then drizzle the honey on it. That's the ideal, right? But actually the natural form of honey is a crystallized, much more solid, like peanut butter form. Mm -hmm. um, but because they, there was a market, honey is liquid. And that's what people expected. So when they go to a beekeeper, I've had endless amounts of people confused why my honey is hard because it's raw honey it crystallized in the jar. And it's the same consistency kind of a peanut butter, but that's natural honey. And people are genuinely confused. Much, there's much more education around it now and people are less surprised. But when I first started beekeeping and selling honey, so much confusion. They did not understand why it was hard. That is a bit of a surprise to me too. Uh, but if somebody wants to buy the real honey that's crystallized to a certain extent, they could always heat it up if they wanted the runny stuff. Exactly. And you can heat it up so that it will um, start as liquid. And as long as you keep the jar warm and dry, it will remain liquid. You don't, because pasteurization is heat plus time equals pasteurized, right? So the higher the heat, the shorter the time it requires to pasteurize it. So you can heat honey so that it is still liquid, but without it pasteurizing. I um, mean, that's why it's important. And the biggest thing you can do, anyone to help honey, you wanna help honeybees, buy honey from a local beekeeper. Right, okay. It's as simple as that, right? Is there are lots of beekeepers in Ontario. There's lots of beekeepers all across Canada. Trust me, no matter where you live, there's unless you really live in the middle of nowhere, there's going to be a beekeeper nearby and supporting them means you're supporting the honeybees. So if you love honeybees, but are terrified of them, best thing you can do is spend money locally. And then it will be good for you too, because you're eating the local crop. I'm just thinking of people listening to this that you know would want to do this. And I like the path that you're talking about where you, know, you take some courses, you connect with a mentor and you follow a beekeeper around for a while because a lot of people, I, I, I'm just thinking of people who be, are interested in this, but you know, maybe like me live in an apartment and go, there's no way that's going to fly around here. Uh, but you can get out and do it. And if you got to the level of expertise where you really kind of had a sense and you're ready to go, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you can approach farmers and, and say, look, uh, I've taken this course, here's my mentor, I belong to this association, and I'd, uh, could I keep some hives on your property that they're quite open to that? Like, they're, uh, people, if, if, if they explore it and they're interested in it, um, there are options out there even for apartment dwellers. Yeah, but there are, that is the single most common way of keeping honeybees, um, is that very few people are generationally own huge amounts of land in order to keep their honeybee colonies on these giant tracts of land. Very, yeah. very few people. So by and large, you're just going to have beekeepers who have agreements with farmers. You know, I'll give you 10 kilos of honey every year and so much beeswax, and I'll keep 30 colonies on your, on your property. That very, very common and um, lots, and because education keeps going, going and, and, and it's a, in the media, more people are coming to local beekeeping associations saying, I own a bunch of land. Uh, I'm oh. an organic vegetable grower. Can oh, you come right. keep colonies on, on yeah. I will have a mutually beneficial, beneficial relationship, or I just have a giant amount of land and I don't use it for anything. So come put bees on my land. It's very, even though we're, we're used to living in these cities, which are really built up, very few cities don't, you know, you drive for half an hour or an hour, you're going to be out in the middle of farmland, sure. right? In the middle of just giant tracts of land, which, um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a great way that if you're like, I live exactly like you say, I live in an apartment, but I still want to keep bees. Well, there's going to be someone out there near enough by, you know, like people have horses who live in downtown Toronto. They don't keep yeah. them in their apartments, right? It's yeah. the same idea. Yeah, but I, the, the farmers that I know, like, honestly, I think the most of them, they, they wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have to say, I'll keep 30. Like, I, they, if you said, I just want to put one up there, it's just a hobby, they go, go at it. Like, they're not going to worry about getting honey back or, or beeswax. That would just be bonus for the average farmer I know. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's, it's obvious. It's like if you hunt somebody's land, you, you may share, but so exactly. it's that, yeah, it's that sort of thing. But yeah. I, and, and it doesn't hurt to get, uh, you know, city people out onto the farms and see what the heck's going on there in real life. So yeah. And you will, uh, you, be you will become, yeah, you'll become obsessed with oh, the yeah. weather. 
obsessed with it. That's yeah. <laughs> I I never really even thought about those elements. Call it. It's never come up when in, in the things that I've watched about how much more there is. It's not just plant the seed, come back in the fall uh, yeah. with uh, bees any more than it is with with uh, farming. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Would there be any issues with any particular types of livestock if you were to do something like that? Um, so I've worked or had um, colonies that were with cows, sheep, chickens, horses. Um, the biggest thing is um, a bears can be a big issue. So if you're up on the Bruce Peninsula, anything like that, um, or you know, in, in the backwoods in BC, you're going to have problems with bears. They love honeybees and it has nothing to do with honey. It has everything to do with the protein from the brood. Bees want the protein. That's what they want when they're going to go hibernate. They're Does not they actually looking. The bees? They will eat the, the developing bees, which are, they go egg, larva, pupa, and then it's an adult. So when they're those former stages, they are it under, they are in the frame and the bees, the um, bears will steal the frames and actually, I've seen it, claw marks. You scoop it out, you eat all of it. But you're blowing open a big, big myth because we <laughs> you see uh, even Winnie the Pooh likes honey. Yeah, they, they, they're brought in by the smell. So honeybee colonies, especially when there's a lot of honey, huge smell. Like I know when there's a honey flow on, I'll walk into an apiary and, oh, I smell goldenrod. I smell goldenrod because they're bringing in the nectar so much that I can smell it. That's what draws the bears in, right? Is a huge smell. And then... They'll go in and they'll knock the hides over. And yes, they'll eat the honey, but they really are. They're looking for protein as well as that, that sweet reward. Um, so they are, they, and they obviously very destructive. Um, so you can put up a, um, a fence, like an electric fence, and by and large, it will keep it away. But you have the same thing. If there's low resources, the bears will be more desperate and more likely to risk being hurt by going through the fence to get at the honeybee colonies. Um, and then, but other than that, like in terms of like cattle and anything, you just put up a fence because cattle will rub their heads on anything no, no. at all. And they'll knock over a honeybee colony accidentally because their head was itchy. Right. Um, but most of the time, like we've never had any problems. Like I, I kept for six or seven years, honeybees on a horse farm. And I've never had, if anything, they love the honeybees because they keep the flies down in their flight path. All right. So the horses, the herd actually figured out that if you stand in front of here, the honeybees fly by you and the, 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 the flies don't bother them as much. So the, I've never had a, a negative experience like that. And it's very common to keep uh, honeybees just along with a small fence in, in any kind of cattle enclosure. They, they'll, they'll be curious occasionally, but most of the time they don't bother. Right. Does the temperament of a hive uh, ever change? Uh, yes. like you, you talked about yours being very, very gentle. And I thought I've yeah. heard about people who said it just got ugly. And, and so, yeah, there can be two drivers with that. One is, um, is a pest is bothering them. Skunks. Skunks are super clever. They, a lot of the time as beekeepers, you don't want to break your back, right? You don't want to hunch over. So you raise your colony up a little bit, but that's the perfect place for a skunk to sneak underneath. And then they lie down and they knock on the front door. And when the guard bees come out, they grab them, roll them on the ground to get rid of their stinger and eat the bee. And then knock, and then knock again and again, all night Rascals. long. And so of course, now the hive is riled up. They're mad. We did not get any sleep. We lost a whole bunch of our guard bees. We don't understand what's happening. Something keeps knocking and they get really mad. So when you come to their colony, you'll look down and you'll see that all the ground in front of their hive is scratched up. You're like, oh, I'm gonna give you this hive. I'm, I'm gonna go over here, <laughs> work over here because they will be very riled up because they're upset. They've had a predator bothering them all night. They're going to be upset. Generally, if you can move the skunk along, even just literally by, I've shoved wood and pieces of debris underneath the hive to keep the skunks from being able to hide because the skunks don't wanna get stung. So they want to hide and still knock. If you take away that avenue, the skunks just give up and find easier things to eat. So the skunk but, is fast enough when it sees a bee come out of the hive. It's fast enough to grab it, yeah, roll it, it on the, the ground. Yep, and then eat it. 
needed. Yeah, because the bees are walking. They're not flying when they come out at night. They're just walking out to investigate. What's that knocking? What's going on? And that's when the, the skunks will come and grab them. Okay. And the second way that bees will suddenly, what feels to a beekeeper, suddenly become very aggressive is if they requeened and they've had a change in genetics. So researchers have found that the vast majority of defensiveness comes from the drones, from the males. So if you have a new queen, she has to go out, she has to mate before coming back and laying eggs. Oh, so right. if she goes out and she mates with what happens to be a whole bunch of uh, highly aggressive drones with genetics that are highly aggressive, she comes back, she starts laying workers and you'll be like, why is this hive so ornery and so defensive? And you realize, actually, this isn't the queen that I used to have. It's a new queen. And it could be that I need to replace her with uh, one that's bred specifically to be gentle because these bees are too defensive. So that was something Paul and I were talking about as, as well. Because, uh, Colette, you, you have a, a business that sells supplies uh, that are specifically for beekeeping. Do I have that right? That I have worked for, but yes, there's many beekeeping. Oh, you work for. Okay. But yeah. isn't that something, is, is there, are there people who breed bees, like queens, and sell yeah. them for, the, for those purposes? And how big a business is that? Uh, that it's, it's growing more and more. So in Ontario, we're very fortunate. We have the Ontario, um, the ORBS program, which is the Ontario Honey Bee Resistant Selection Program. Um, and it is a group of bee breeders. So there's a large group of bee breeders, the Ontario Bee Breeders Association. But within that, there are a small selection of beekeepers who spend, devote their, all their time to selecting healthy, disease resistant, gentle, good honey producers, good producers in the spring, um, oh, wow. you know, lots of different qualities. Um, but there's millions of dollars of research that goes on every year and that slowly gets filtered down into these people um and I've, I've actually been to a number of conferences this this winter um because there's an interest in expanding that is that we do import thousands of queen bees and to a, a smaller extent package bees uh into canada from california hawaii chile italy New Zealand, Australia, so lots of different places where, especially when they have the opposite weather to us or nicer weather to us, they're yeah. able to produce bees at a time of year like April. I'd love to have great queens, but Ontario has really bad weather, so we can't produce our own queen. So we rely on this import market, but what we've realized is that the import market, although it can be very good, you do have, you're importing bees that are adapted to a different environment than the one that you're asking them to live in. Yeah. So a way to get around that is to have these, some, a certain percentage of the beekeepers producing their own. It's, I can, I, I'll be selling nucleus colonies this year where I'll be selling off my old, my queens from last year to, to in, in smaller packages so that people can start, like you say, a, a hobby beekeeper can start to learn. Um, but in terms of selecting, rearing and breeding really good queens, that's to a much smaller group of people. Um, and there's so much more interest now as we get greater number of people into this hobby, we realize like, do we want to be importing all these bees or maybe do we want to overwinter a whole bunch of queens and maybe start selling those queens? Yeah. And then we're not so reliant on transporting because a big thing with pandemic was the transportation yeah. and the reduction of flights meant that a whole bunch of honeybee queens and packages died, which of course impacted Canada. So we're, we're they're slowly becoming a shift and an interest in getting people with these amazing skills to select these queens and these bees to have these gentle um, qualities, but also have all these awesome things like disease resistance and honey production. The dairy industry at one time was in a similar situation. And so... Uh, and now I just found it fascinating on how they addressed it. Like once they started doing uh, uh, like uh, all these measurements that you talked about with, with, with bees, uh, like in the dairy industry, you can look up online any Holstein cow in Canada and you can find out all the things that you're interested in when you're trying to build good genetics in your herd. So how even how easy is this cow to hook up to a milking machine and what percentage of this or this. And so it re, what, what's happened is, is where I think Canada at the time, I haven't checked this in a while, had 5% of the Holstein population in the, on the planet. But 
Once they started doing this, they started to export 15% of the genetics uh, because uh, they, they were, the, the genetics were strong. And I would find that fascinating to see what they're doing with, with bees because you've mentioned some of the things that they're looking for. And then you know, if I'm a beekeeper and I want to get online and I can find out, all righty, and they're doing the research, that, that I think uh, you're right. I think that's going to make a huge difference. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, the whole even just the idea around buy local. You can buy local bees, literally yeah. adapted to where you live. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's that's where the Ontario Beekeepers Association really does come into its own, and, and it's been very good at this because we're very we're we feel like a very old association. I know some agricultural associations are much older than us, but we have been running since I think the 1880s. Um, so we have this long this long history of bringing beekeepers together, sharing information, and then producing good healthy bees and that's where it, it's really great because the the website has a whole list of anyone who sells bees and any of these orbs produce who are very selective in, in how they make their bees um, so that it, it's kind of the one-stop shop where okay if you want to learn about bees in Ontario or you want to learn about bees in Alberta there is an association which governs the whole province you can go there and find out a ton of information and kind of launch yourself in all these different areas and learn a bunch of different things. So you actually maintain a data, a historical database of, of beekeepers and what they breed and the, 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 the characteristics of those hives? Yeah, so each uh, bee breeder will have it, their own um, selection criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we, we very much encourage people, get to know your beekeepers, especially if it's important to you, because of course there are different types of honeybees, right? You know, Europe is a massive place. There are a number of different bees. So the, the, uh, the Buckfast bee, which is, it, it's very famous from brother Adam, who, who did a lot of genetics um, and, and brought the honeybees into this very much more like domestication idea. Um, the Buckfast uh, still produce um, the, the Abbey still produces bees. And here in Canada, we have a number of people who specifically work with Buckfast bees or, you know, a, a, what is known as a Saskatraz bees. So they're actually, they're, they're from Saskatchewan, but they are from originally a, um, a university genetic um, research program that they now sell to the public. So it's a very, they have specific criteria. And so once you start to de delve into this different types of, of genetics and different breeds of bees, um, you can actually decide, I really want, you know, some Russian bees or whatever it is. And you can actually go and find a local producer who selects very specific things um, and, and basically buy exactly like your designer handbag. You know, you can go out and you can find exactly the kind of bee that you're interested in keeping. Is there a certification process or any way of verification of these sort of this sort of information? Um, so the the within the OBBA and Orbs program, there is a there's rigorous membership for the Orbs. You have to be um, uh, getting hygienic testing for two to three years before you're allowed to advertise. Right. All of these different things. Um, so there are some selection criteria, but it's always been when I started beekeeping very strange to me that anybody can just go out and buy bees anybody there's no you know there's no qualification there's no hoop to jump through you just go and buy bees you're like that's amazing i can't go buy a gun but i can go buy a whole colony of bees okay um so it's always been very strange to me so we we, we push we encourage for education but there's no actual certification you can go and learn beekeeping entirely on your own you're probably gonna make a lot of mistakes um, and take some time, you can speed it up by going and talking to experts, obviously. Um, but there's no actual certification, but that's where the ORS program is trying to, to market themselves. Again, we come back to that marketing that to get people to understand that we're different and we're different because, um, and one of these things is this um, membership criteria to be part of our group. How long, do you have any idea how long it's been where humans have been uh, purposefully cultivating a relationship with bees? I, I looked this up, actually. I gave a, um, a, um, a, a group of senior citizens, they have um, basically like a radio talk show. It's, it's the strangest thing because there's no visuals. So I couldn't, I couldn't give a PowerPoint presentation. I was like, what am I going to do? Yeah. So I talked about the history of beekeeping. And actually, there's some really super interesting research has come out recently that it's 
further back than we even realized is we, we very much identify with kind of like the Egyptian times because of finding honey, but actually it's much, much earlier than that uh, with the association and the realization that um, it's not just the products that you get from the honeybees, but it's your, your crops do better when you have the honeybees with you. Wow. Um, goes back to even thousands of years prior to that. Um, and the, and obviously um, honeybee, European honeybees is what we're used to, but there are species of Asian honeybees look it up if you've never done it it's um apis dorsata they have the coolest defense mechanism they mesmerize uh and by basically coordinating their body movement and they create these giant waves and opt optical illusions with their bodies it's absolutely fascinating because they hang from trees so they're the giant honeybee and they hang from trees so honey hunters have existed for thousands of years in asia is these very brave, slightly crazy people who go and they climb cliffs and they climb trees I've to literally this. cut yeah. sections of honeycomb out of these wild natural bee populations. Yeah. And they don't, they might have a smoker if they're lucky, but by and large, they're just getting stung. And it, it's a dangerous thing, obviously, because you're hanging trying to collect this stuff. Um, so there, there's a very long history that extends thousands of years of uh, wherever there were honeybees, any kind of honeybee, any kind of apis species. Um, those are the honeybees that produce these larger volumes of honey. There have always been um, hunters out there um, going and collecting the wax and the honey. Do you get to a point, Colette, where you've been stung enough that you... Uh, it, it it doesn't bother you like it, it is you're uh, you're I don't want to say immune but um, um maybe it so is. if if I could if I was a migratory beekeeper so some beekeepers will work a season in Canada and then they'll go to New Zealand and they'll keep working you probably because the um the venom the AP venom that's in your body um it it is it builds up a natural immunity your body isn't you won't swell as much your histamine reaction is definitely suppressed because uh -huh. your body's like whatever it's more of the ap venom who cares kind of thing right. but if you don't do that half the year you're not exposed to honeybees so i'm excited for the first few stings of the year because i want my body to recognize that venom again and not have a big histamine reaction because that's where the danger comes in, right? Is yeah. the, the anaphylaxis, even though it's incredibly rare, that's what people fear is the anaphylaxis reaction. And that's just an, a massive overreaction of your body and a massive flooding of histamines, which causes the swelling. Yeah. So you can, you like, I do definitely, I'm very fortunate. I've never been stung very much as long as I've been intelligent and removed the stinger. Oh. The worst thing I ever got was I was, preparing hives for pollination. It was really late at night. Um, and we've been working all day and I got stung in the eyebrow and I, I flicked it, whatever, keep going. And I didn't get the stinger out. It sat in there for several hours before I finally removed it. So the venom sac that comes with the stinger keeps pumping with a little heart and pumping that venom into my face. I looked like a chipmunk for two days. I didn't um, Because realize. the whole side of my face was swollen. Now, if you pull it out, yeah. Do you have to make sure you don't pinch that thing and just inject it all at once? Uh, okay. Yes. I've only there been stung technique. once and it was in the between the shoulder blades, so I couldn't see it at all. And I thought something had shot me. Yeah, there there is a, a, a technique to it, and high tools is what we use, little pry bars is what we use oh, okay. to manipulate our colony. <laughs> and the best thing you can do is, is take your flat edge of your high tool and flick it out. Because the barbs, again, the barbs will stay in your hand and get really itchy and your your uh, skin will try and remove them. Fair <laughs> enough. It seems so but, long uh, since I had a bee sting, I didn't even realize you had to do it. Yes. Yeah, yeah and that's what we teach new beekeepers is we'll show them, like, I, I can sting myself in my arm. You can see the sack and you can see it pumping that little heart. And okay. we show them how to take it out so that they realize that's what it looks like. And okay. I've had it where I made a mistake. I was... I pulled too hard and a bunch of frames got jostled and I got stung like 10 times in my thigh. It was terrible. Oh, but because of the clothing, that's why we say wear loose clothing. Because if the bees sting the clothing, it's a lot easier to just pull the clothing away from your skin, removing yeah. all the stingers altogether, right. rather than it being directly in your skin. Colette, I'm, I'm very curious what sort of the life cycle of a hive is you you've talked about breeding oh. queens how, how if i buy a if i buy a I start a hive how, how long is my queen going to live and how long will the hive last 
So uh, essentially, the, the life cycle of the honeybee, it's all based around the queen. And she, as long as she is mated, she in general will live up to five years. But with the stressors of the environment, pesticides and all these different things, generally she's going to be living two to three years. So I get my colony in May. I need to know whether or not this is this year as in 2022, or is it a 2021 queen? There are advantages and disadvantages of both options, but it's important as a beekeeper to know that, okay? I've got a 2022 queen, wonderful. I mean, she's new this year, she's young, she should be laying up 1,500 eggs a day. Yes, so you start out with just a few frames and the queen will, the, the worker bees, all those other females will be drawing out all that wax creating space to store the honey and the nectar and the, the sorry the nectar and the pollen and all of the brood so all the baby bees um, and then that's where the colony grows up to 60,000 honeybees and then you put the honey supers on and it grows to a taller thing um, and then once it comes to winter they unceremoniously kick all the drones out because the male bees have no business in the winter they're just they suck up resources and don't give anything because drones which are the male bees they don't collect anything they don't clean anything they don't defend anything they don't even have stingers so what i do when i demonstrate hives i give people drone bees to play with because they have no stinger you can literally rub the little bum on your hand if you want i did not know that so they're they're a great way to, to have kids play with bees because it's perfectly safe because they have absolutely nothing because their whole point they are a genetic package their whole point is to mate and die. That is it. Sure. So if they make it all the way to fall, they get kicked out of the hive because they don't want them. Sometimes you'll get colonies that are strong enough that are like, okay, you can live, brother. We'll give you another season. Um, but by and large, you're going to kick them all out. And so in the winter, you just have that ball of bees with the queen in the middle. And those are all the female worker bees. And they're keeping her warm. And there's a huge attrition rate. You're going to be losing 40 to 50% of that ball of bees throughout the winter. And then that what's left needs to be enough to keep the queen warm, clean everything and start building up again in the spring. And so what you'll have is the queen, she might run out of sperm, right? Because she only goes on really one mating flight during her life, like where she's mating multiple times, but it'll be only one point in her life. She can't go out and get any more because queens are actually too heavy to fly when they're laying eggs. Right. Um, so the queen, she'll never leave the colony. She'll live her two to three, however many seasons. And then she might run out of sperm. She might just start to get old and tattered. You'll see queens with no wings anymore. They've got, you know, four legs instead of six and, and battered wings. And you're like, that's an old lady. She's an old girl. And, and her pheromone will start to fade. So her pheromone controls and suppresses the um, ovaries of all of these other workers and tells the hive, I'm still here, I'm still healthy, everything's fine. But when she ages, her pheromone weakens and then you don't get the smell throughout the hive. And then the workers are like, I don't smell the queen anymore, something's wrong, we gotta start building new queen cells, this is not okay, we have to have a queen. And then they will replace the queen. So there's multiple reasons why a queen could die or, or not be good enough anymore, and then they'll replace her. How, and then in theory, how, the hive will continue. Without you, how do they replace? Um, so any fertilized egg is a female egg. And oh. any fertilized egg can be turned into a queen. Because the only difference between a worker bee and a queen is actually the nutrition and the size of cell that they grew up in. Oh. Um, the, the flat frames that you see beekeepers holding up in these beautiful pictures, those are all worker bees. Um, the queen, it's almost like a a peanut in a shell that's what it looks like that's the size of a queen cell and it's because she needs way more royal jelly everything drones workers queens they all get royal jelly which is a mixture of pollen honey and a whole bunch of enzymes that the bees themselves have created with their mouth parts and they it's this white kind of um very i've tasted it of course i've tasted it um it tastes like lemon sour milk so it's a very lemony taste but it's very sour as well and the queen develops into a much larger bee and has the ability of those developing ovaries um, in, in order to become a queen. So that's the only difference. It's really nutrition and the size of her cell allows. So if the bees realize they're like, we don't have a queen, they go and they search for either um, old eggs. So they, they, it will stay an egg for three days or a young larva, which is four, five, six days old. 
they will turn them, they will literally change the shape of it, and feed it like crazy, give it like a hundred times as much royal jelly, and then that will turn into a new queen. And if there are multiple queens, so when they're virgin queens, oh, they're aggressive and they move fast because they want to be number one. So if multiple queens emerge at the same time, they fight to the death and whoever survives, that's the queen. If one queen emerges before all the others do, she actually tells the worker bees to go and chew a hole in the side of the cell and she stings her to death because the queen is the only one that doesn't have barbs on her stinger because she wants to be number one. They're gladiators. She's like, no, there can only be one of me in this colony. The rest of you got to die. And she, she's then victorious over the other queens and then she will go out and she will mate and become the new queen. So there is a point where uh, the colony is, is, yeah. is trying to create more than one queen for redundancy, but as yeah. soon as one, as soon as one emerges and everybody knows that's the queen, the other's got to die. Exactly. And you can actually hear it. It's called queen piping. Beep, 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 beep. They will actually call two other queens to challenge them to a fight mm -hmm. because they know as soon as they're born, they're like, I got to be the only one. And right. so they, they, it's the built in their genetics that they know there's a possibility of other queens. So you as a beekeeper, if you accidentally put, you, you have multiple colonies open and you put the wrong queen in, the worker bees will kill her. And if they don't, the other queen will kill her because it's a challenge to her authority in the colony. There can only be one of us. Rare circumstances, you can't have more than one queen, but by and large, it has to only be one and she will defend her right to be the one queen. Uh, now, if I want to go buy some honey tomorrow, uh, uh, Colette, uh, my first step would be to find out who processes, uh, who's local, you know, who's making yeah. it around here. And, uh, so what question should I be asking that beekeeper before I decide that they're the beekeeper that I want to buy honey from? Um, it's finding, is it their own honey? Do they produce it themselves? Because it's very common to purchase uh, honey from other beekeepers. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Any of these really big companies that you see in the grocery store, they're probably going to be purchasing honey from other beekeepers. That's still local. It's still great. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, if you want super hyper local and to be supporting a small business that's, you know, right near you. Yes. Um, farmers markets in that because you have the beekeeper there in general. Um, if you get your questions answered, to be like, are you the beekeeper? Do you keep colonies in the, in nearby? Because obviously you have a, you know, a personal taste. So getting, you know, buying a smaller jar to figure out like, do I like the way that this beekeeper processes honey, how it tastes? Yeah. Um, and the beekeeper himself will know a lot about the flavor of the honey, right? Because as beekeepers, we're, we're constantly tasting our own products, right? So we I worked for a commercial beekeeper and I worked in the store in the winter and someone phoned up and said, I want a honey that's less sweet. Oh, like, yeah. it's funny. So deadpan, this, this one staff member said, try buckwheat honey, because it has a much more stringent taste. So it does, it's just as sweet as any other honey, but it just doesn't taste as sweet. Yeah. So yeah. as beekeepers, you're going to know that, uh, what your honey tastes like and be like, you know, do you want a creamed honey? Or do you want a raw honey or a liquid honey or a flavored honey? Because I do that as well. Whereas I'll buy local strawberries from a farmer, I'll dry them and I'll blend them with my honey for a different taste and kind of a different experience. So getting to know your beekeeper and, and what they do and why they do it can be a great way. And you'll, you'll be much more willing to invest your money in something that you feel personally attached to. Are there potentially, though, any things that they might have done, like if there was a problem with the hive and they medicated the bees uh, with, with something? Like uh, are those sorts of questions or uh, like even regionally, if I've got a, uh, uh, you, you know, a, a hive that is uh, um, it's in the country, but there's a big industrial factory off to the side. Uh, are those things that can affect the overall quality of the, the honey or passing, you know, like, I don't know, I'm just thinking like lead or whatever, you know, are, are those sorts of things, uh, 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 could they be potential problems? Because, uh, you know, they're all free range bees, but where are they ranging? Yeah. 
Yeah, so they, they can, they, they, those things can always be a problem. Thankfully, um, the government programs have eliminated basically lead in anything um, because they regularly check. I was checked for the first time last year. They randomly ask you to donate jars of their honey to test for moisture content Ooh. or color grading for labeling, for antibiotic exposure, pesticide, anything like that. So there is a regular, in each of the different provinces and different territories, there's regulations that come behind that and they are constantly sampling. They're so you would ask that, you say, when was the last time your honey was tested? And that, that, that would help. And then I never thought of that, but you said there, if you have, you're supposed to register your hive. And did the hive inspectors not just look at the hive, but the region for the p possibility the the bees might inadvertently bring additives back? Um, they would, but thankfully bees are big filters in terms of if they were exposed to a pesticide, the the vast majority of the time they die before getting back to the colony. That's the fortunate kind of side of it is okay. that they're not spreading it into the colony um, and that because the honey requires, nectar requires a lot of processing to turn it into honey, it's very, very rare for any kind of thing to occur, like to actually be present, oh, that could be of any any harm to humans, for sure. Excellent to know, good. You mentioned uh, one of the natural predators of bees was the, the varroa mite? The varroa, yes. What what other natural predators would, would bees have? You, you also mentioned skunks. I read something uh, about uh, the American fowl brood bacterial disease. Is that yes. a big issue? Uh, it can be. Um, uh, regulations prevent it from being a big issue. So American fowl brood and European fowl brood are both reportable diseases in Ontario oh. and have very strict regulations on what you do as a beekeeper when you find them. And that's where the bee inspectors really come in to be very useful. Um, any colony that is transported anywhere, you know, for pollination, anything like that, it must be inspected um, for these things, for the varroa mite, as well as these different. So there are, unfortunately, innumerable viruses that are spread by these varroa mites. Um, and you control the viruses by controlling your varroa. So that's why it's always inspected. But then you have these different bacterial diseases like sac brood, American fowl brood, and European fowl brood. And the difficulty with something like American fowl brood is that it's a spore forming bacteria, which means it can exist in the spore form in its you know, um, quiet senescent form for um, dozens of years. So, oh, hey, my, my father kept bees 75 years ago. Do you want the equipment? You know, it's an exaggeration, but I see, yeah. this spore forming bacteria can be alive in that old equipment. Um, and that's where the education component, component really comes in. You can use antibiotics prophylactically to control this particular bacteria, um, but it's obviously highly regulated. And once the World Health Organization changed the rules around it, you now require a vet certificate in order to be able to access this antibiotic, which is, I think, a really great thing because mm -hmm. we only have so many antibiotics in the world. And this is an antibiotic that's used in many different types of farming. So having more controls over it to make sure that people are not abusing it is very important. Um, it never gets used around honey supers. It's never a chance of it being in honey. They still check it just in case. Um, but it is it's a, a beekeeper to educate yourself on the positive and negatives around it and to be able to identify it. Most important thing you can do is identify all these various pests and diseases um, because you have different pests like the wax moth or the small hive beetle. Um, which are mainly nuisance pests. You can keep them under control as long as you keep happy, healthy, strong colonies, right? So we're always teaching people that this is what you want. You want healthy, strong colonies, strong colonies. Oh, by the way, the rural might um, exponentially grow. So when you have a strong colony, you got to worry more about the rural might. So these beekeepers have this push and pull and push and pull and constantly learning and figuring out the best way to keep all of the different pests and diseases in check um, because there are a lot of problems that come up. And the more you learn, the more you think, how do these honeybees even exist? We have so many, there's so many issues. And yeah. you just think, I, I, my goodness, there's so much to learn all the time. Well, let's say you had some equipment that somehow got infected with, with uh, the foul brood. Uh, 
you know, I guess once it's it's discovered, what do you do? You 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 can't just you can't just throw something with that bacteria out in the garbage. You must burn it. I was, was yes. Uh, in Ontario, each jurisdiction again. This is why it's so important to have local information. In Ontario, you must kill the bees and burn the hive. That it that that is how it's done. Other jurisdictions have different rules, but there are very specific things you need to do because it it spreads very easily and is a big problem. And as a commercial beekeeper, if you're keeping forty or sixty colonies in one location, it could spread and you have to kill all of them. And that that's a terrible day. I've I've only had to do a few colonies in the commercial setting, and it, it's terrible when you have to kill bees and, and burn a colony. Um, and it is it's a big it's a big issue. You have to dig a big hole and pour diesel fuel on it, light it on fire. I imagine apiarists are, are emotionally attached to their, their hives, much like, say, John, uh, some, a dog owner would be attached to their pet. You know, it, it, would, be, yeah. it would be an emo emotionally traumatic to have to burn your colonies. Exactly. And you do you and you 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 have favorites. It doesn't matter how many colonies you have, whether you have five colonies, you have five thousand. You have favorites, and it could be the color of them. It could be their temperament. It could be how much honey they produce for you. Just whatever. It's just this yard is just so wonderful, and every colony in here is so happy. You do. You get emotionally invested, and it, it can be very hard. Um, and but that's with anyone who works with a herd of anything. Uh, it's the same thing. Is that you know you're going to lose some, and you know it's going to be hard, but. The, the reward that you get, the joy that you get from working with these animals has to exceed those kind of negatives for you to keep going year after year. Mm -hmm. And there's just, it's, there's multiple levels to the, uh, the advantage. I mean, you do have the, uh, you've got a nice hobby and, uh, uh, and you can get some honey and maybe some, uh, some wax, but those bees are doing things for the world outside of your vision as well so yeah I, I, that's one of the reasons that i thought this would be an interesting topic to to explore it, it's uh it's, it's multi-tiered yeah. yes exactly yeah colette you you've uh you, you've blown my mind i <laughs> when, when i when i when john and i talked about this we said i i thought i don't know what john thought i said oh well maybe we'll talk for about 30 to 45 minutes before we're over an hour and a half now and yeah I just it, it, there's so many things about about uh, being a beekeeper that I had no idea. It's it's really in depth uh, topic, and you certainly you know it, and we really appreciate <laughs> your time. And, yeah, uh, well, I always yeah I tell people that I never go to a party and tell people I'm a beekeeper unless all I want to do all night long is talk about bees. Yeah. Yes. It's it's nice when you're you're doing something that you're passionate about. For sure. So the first step for anybody interested in beekeeping, I guess, would be to, to, to look at the Ontario Beekeepers Association website and see what courses are available and yeah. sort of, uh, or, or, you know, whatever state or province yeah. you're in. And, uh, exactly. and then get, get yourself educated is really what it boils down to. And if you want to avoid disappointment, education is key because there's so many things to learn. There's so many challenges and so many things that you need to be paying attention to and aware of is that the key to success is just educating yourself and never stopping. Is that I, I worked for a beekeeper with 50 years of experience and I was like, awesome. I'm going to learn everything from him and I'm going to have no doubts and every decision I make is going to be the right one. And within two months, I was like, I'm so disappointed. You ask so many questions and you talk to other beekeepers all the time and you, you, you're unsure sometimes. And he's like, yes, because the, the bees are always changing. There's always new things to learn. And I was like, oh, OK, I guess I can just spend the rest of my life learning. And that's yeah. the kind of perspective that I have now. Nothing the matter with that. Yeah. No, nothing at all. Well, again, thank you so much for doing this. It, it's it's been eye opening. So I, you're, I, you're very I'm welcome. Sure, I'm sure we'll have more questions at some point in the future, but uh, your time is greatly appreciated. You're very welcome. All right. Thanks, Colette. Okay. Have Great. a great day. Bye now. Bye bye. bye.